Okay, hello, hi everyone, and welcome to today's presentation, Semantic Knowledge Graphs are the, governance, are the Governance Architecture of the Future. Let me start by introducing you to today's speaker. Unfortunately, Ralph Hodgson will not be able to join today's webinar. However, Jesse Lambert, our Semantic Solutions Architect at Top Quadrant, will lead us through today's presentation. Today's focus will include a brief overview of data governance, a discussion of a few data governance challenges, a review of knowledge graphs and review use cases, a discussion of the technology behind them. We'll then go into a demo and wrap up with a brief Q&A as time allows. Before we get started, let's review a few logistical items. Please feel free to ask questions as we go along by using your GoToWebinar controls. To post questions, please look on the right-hand side control panel. You should see a drop-down box for questions. If you click on the box, you should be able to post your question at any time during the presentation. We will address as many of these questions as time allows at the conclusion of the webinar. We will also be recording today's presentation, and we'll send a link to the recorded version as well. With that, I'll hand it over to Jesse to get us started. Jesse? Thank you, Christy. Um, and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. We are Top Quadrant, founded in 2001, which is the same year that the vision of the Semantic Web was born. We've been engaged with the Semantic Web standards from the beginning and offer enterprise knowledge graph technology. We'll talk more about our knowledge graph technology called Top Rate Edge, enterprise data governance, shortly. But first, let's talk a little bit about what we're here for. And that's data governance. The data governance triangle that you see in front of you at this point is trying to say or show or hint at the fact that there's multiple modes that we see people uh, taking or using to approach data governance in the enterprise. Many come at it from an executive level, um, and this is what we call top down. And th there's a great desire here, really the desire to um, identify data governance in general and then put a framework and methodology around it. And this is also where you would see like new um, uh, roles and job titles coming from. And there's usually a great desire, but it's very much so from a top down perspective. Other approaches, um, another common approach is to come at it from a bottom up or representative governance, as we call it. And here, um, you, you can really get some really quick wins. Um, so it's a very common pattern that we see, and this allows you to put like controlled vocabularies like taxonomies and glossaries and reference data sets in place very quickly, start creating data catalogs and interconnecting data elements. Um, but a lot of times it's done without the executive side of things in mind. And then even at the same time, another mode is to quickly identify what the ultimate desire is, like lineage and data quality and the other big picture uh, data governance aspects. And that's you know applying the governance directly. So it can be a difficult thing to actually jump straight to the applied governance because you've got a lot of unknowns whenever you go that approach. What we like to say is, is that the bullseye is right in the middle. That's what we need to be shooting for. And to get there, it can be quite a challenge. There's, you know, I guess jokingly, I'm gonna call this slide the great wall of data governance. There's a lot of common challenges um, and I can't list them all here, but let's just chime off a few of them. Um, getting everyone to have a consistent meaning, whether it's just on a glossary term or a business capability, uh, there's there's a lot of area to, um, to strengthen the meaning meaning and get everyone speaking the same language. Um, variety, which is usually thought of as being more difficult than volume and velocity. So the variety of content and data and unstructured, it all starts to be a, a large variety of content. That content comes from new sources all, all the time. A new source and with a new source comes maybe new requirements, new security, all kinds of aspects simply by saying that there's a new source of content or a new source of data available. And that source might actually be something that's just in your enterprise, but you never thought of it as a data source. So the variety of sources and the meaning, it all starts to build upon each other. And we're working our way up this wall. Uh, new infrastructure, 
I want to move to the cloud, I want to change clouds, I want to create my own cloud, uh, containerization, all kinds of different new infrastructure to be dealing with. So where a source of information was today, it might not be there tomorrow. So a lot of different rapid changes happening in these environments. And last uh, on the wall right now would be new roles and new personnel, because with those new roles and those new personnel comes new ideas and new desires. So you're talking about new, basically from the bottom up here. And it's because really data governance is a new aspect and it's really broad sweeping approach that covers a lot of what was considered traditional um, IT, DevOps, uh, security, quality, Data governance is starting to encapsulate all of these kinds of things. Um, so today, you know, it's the scope and the diversity that is really starting to cause a, a, an issue, or it has always caused an issue with doing, quote, data governance. Now, th the reality of today, though, is, is that data governance, due to existing environments or legacy environments, um, data governance is an afterthought. Um, you know, the, the rear guard comes in and tries to apply data governance or achieve data governance in an already operational environment. So things are already in motion. And then the data governance folks that have that desire, they're coming in late to the party because really IT and DevOps, this is where, um, you know, a lot of reality sits in. Now, hopefully this slide doesn't offend anyone, um, just for a little bit of a joke here, not that all IT or DevOps types people or infrastructure people are pulling their hair out, but they have a right to. Um, these are the people that make the world spin. These are the people that keep us plugged in and operational and always going. We don't like it whenever the screen doesn't populate what we want it to. So these are the people that keep us moving. They pull the strings. And whenever there's something new, these are the people that first know it. They know whenever there's something different in an environment or a need for something different and whenever something's moving in ways that it never moved before, these are really the folks that the data governance team really needs to be tapping into and forming a team. But the thing is, is that often um, the IT, DevOps, infrastructure guys, they're left at odds with and they're on the other side of the wall. And on the, on the other side, the data governance folks, they're coming in and they've got a lot of good desires and they're asking a lot of really good questions. And it's something that moving forward, we want to slowly get these teams to be fully united and have a data governance platform in place that allows them to be on the same team and they can be working from the design phase all the way through to the monitoring phase and, and be able to answer the big questions like regulation and compliance and quality and where is the content. That way they're not asking the question always after the fact. It'd be better if we're able to answer those questions at any time during the life cycle of a system. So to provide a solution, which we believe top rate edge and knowledge graphs do, we need to introduce knowledge graphs again. And I'll, I'll try to be quick with this. Um, Talk Quadrant has a lot of information on its website, past webinars, white papers, case studies about the importance and real capabilities of knowledge graphs. So I'm really not going to do them justice in this presentation because it's a different kind of webinar. Um, but it, so if you want more information, visit our website, contact us, and, and we can really get you hooked up with, with the information that you need to know. But, but ultimately, a knowledge graph is... Uh, is a, is a repository for bringing not just the data, but the models of that data and the expectations of that data into the same environment. So that's what we mean whenever we say that it's a knowledge domain. So if you have an idea of, uh, on the right-hand side here, if you can read the small print, there's a model about people and people have eye colors. And then there's a rule that says if, if both parents of a person both have blue eyes, then that person that is the child will have blue eyes as well. And this is all represented using the same pattern, the graph representation. So the, the rule or the expectations, the model of how you can use that data and what you can do with that data, and then the data or facts itself 
are all in the same environment. This is a very powerful technique. And with semantic standards, um, there's nothing proprietary here. This is, this is metadata for everyone, and it's not just adding to the black box problem of some sort of proprietary mechanism that is representing your data in only uh, a for them kind of way. With knowledge graphs, you're representing it in a standard way. And you can represent all kinds of different knowledge graphs and then connect them to each other as necessary. It's actually what Top Rate Edge does. But before we talk about Edge, let's see some use cases about knowledge graphs in general. Graph traversal being step one. No more complex joins. We basically can traverse the graph to our liking. And with a semantic representation, we can actually do it on purpose. We know what we could be looking for specifically instead of hard coding some sort of like traversal logic. So with a semantic graph, we're free to traverse the graph. Once we can traverse the graph, we can do all kinds of analytics with it. Once we can do analytics with it, we can understand it and therefore we can provide a unified model. This is really where the schema and the model, what we call ontologies, the the model or or design um, in the last webinar if anyone has seen it I called it a blueprint so the ontology data model is the blueprint from for your data and with graph representations we can unify it um, a data element is a data element regardless of where it came from or what serialization it was in so we can bring it unite it and then what we can do then is aggregate it with everything so that you get that 360 degree view of everything that's in that knowledge graph and other knowledge graphs that it can connect to and reach out to. Once we can do that, we can derive insights. We can basically look for patterns and um, you, reasoning patterns, inferencing patterns, suggestions, recommendations. These are all possible scenarios now that we've got it represented in a semantic graph. And ultimately, almost like I had started with, with graph traversal. With ontologies and semantic standards in place, I can traverse the, the graph on purpose with an intention. So I can actually look across something with the lineage and I can say, well, I'm dealing with the data element. Where is my data element at in a data set? And possibly go downstream wondering, where is that data set actually being stored inside of a virtual, a virtual machine on some application server in what country inside of which data center. I can actually on purpose with intention traverse um, the graph and derive any type of lineage provenance and um, you know there's a lot of freedom there and a lot of logic that we can build directly into the model and the rules that are all in the same place instead of trying to hard code some sort of business logic in some programming language. Now with Top Rate Edge, you get all of these features in an enterprise package. We have audit logs and controlled workflows with approval processes. We've got the full inferencing engine and modeling language all built into a single environment with many models to, uh, to represent the different modes of data governance. You have one-stop shop knowledge graph with this meaningful representation that allows you and supports coming at it from a top down, bottom up, and from middle out, all in one environment. So with Edge, one of the most important things is the information architecture that's built into it, the semantic models that are there for you. So if you think of managing your governance assets inside of a knowledge graph, you would want to be able to have miniature little knowledge graphs that were focused and did what they were supposed to do well and then they could connect to other graphs that were doing what they did well so that's what we've done with edge is a nice separation of concerns design in the information architecture so that you can manage taxonomies separately from glossaries and you can manage data sets separate from the technical assets that operate those those or access those data assets so we have different types of asset collections that cover hundreds of predefined assets. So Top Rate Edge actually knows about a lot of different things that exist in a real world environment, 
you can customize and tailor them. We'll actually see those in the demo without ever bringing the system down. This is real-time changes and modifications to models, and it's all gonna reflect instantly for the user interface and for programmatic interfaces. That's really the focus of the demo today, or the webinar. And this is all being done so that we can collaborate, catalog, and curate in a highly connected way. And that's really the power of the knowledge graph, is the connections, it's what's important. So, what we'll do today, uh, Christy said that we'll be doing the webinar and then we'll go into demo mode. Um, and because of some last minute changes, I'm actually gonna roll a little bit differently and I'm gonna pop in and out of multiple small demos. So this first demo, what I wanna do is show the flexibility of knowledge graphs. And we'll use top right edge, of course, um, as, the, as the example. So what I'll do is I'll leave the slide deck, go over to my um, uh, Chrome browser and I'm looking at the top right edge homepage. One thing I'll point out, um, uh, actually, before I point it out, this, this isn't really a top right edge demo in the sense of an overview. We've got uh, videos and uh, all kinds of guides and user guides um, on our website that you can take a look at, and there's videos there to watch if you want like general overviews or if you want to focus on ontologies or one of the specific asset types. There's information there for you. What I want to point out today is it, uh, little um, specific uh, scenarios that, that show off some of the architecture and design capabilities. Um, before I go into this example of flexibility, I'm just going to point out in the blue banner on the left-hand side, the 16 different asset collection types. This is that information architecture, separation of concerns, so that these asset collections can be worked on individually or as teams. Um, at different times and then connected when necessary. Um, and it's the right kind of information being collected in the right place with the right models backing it. Um, this is what Top Rate Edge is designed for. And you don't have to work with all of these. We have different packages that allow you to get the right selection of these. So it's the right fit for the job, for the right price, with the right type of support. Um, that way you're not having to deal with everything all the time. Um, with a full license. So it is something that we, we decompose and target specific scenarios with. I have them all turned on right now, but really what I wanna use, getting back to the demo, let's demo um, flexibility. So I have an idea of something in my mind. I wanna look up what access means. So I search on access here, and Edge is going to launch Search the Edge. This is our dedicated, faceted, semantic search. So I can it does ranking, it brings up um, results to the top based on your search and where the results were found. Um, it provides facets on the left-hand side automatically because of what your search results are. Mostly everything here is probably going to be glossary-related terminology, and it is access that I actually want. So I found what I wanted instantly, and if it was just the definition that I wanted, I could get it from right here. We can even comment and start some collaboration here. Different visualizations are available to you automatically, um, and that's what these icons are, are for, but that's not the focus today. Uh, I wanna get into this glossary, so I'm gonna actually click the hyperlink for access. And at this point, I'm going to be inside of the healthcare glossary. This is just a, a sample uh, example glossary that I have. And I searched on access, I found what I wanted, I clicked on it and it took me into it. And now I'm actually inside of the glossary and access is here and on the right hand side, you're seeing that same definition that we were seeing in the search application. So um, for flexibility purposes, I would say, um, I wanna add something. Um, Top Rate Edge is a turnkey solution but whenever it comes to the assets of the world, everybody may have different intentions and they may have uh, characteristics that are unique to them. So we are a turnkey solution, but the model, um, it's not that it's not done, it's just that we never know what the, what the necessary changes or updates are going to be. So Edge knows what a glossary term is and it's providing me with relationships over here on the right hand side and if i actually show all of my uh, possible relationships by going over to the gear icon and and uh, show all properties you'll see that i've got a lot of relationships that are um, you know not populated so if we wanted to actually specify an acronym um, tag it with some specific code 
And if we wanted to um, go through glossary traceability, we can trace it to an organization that's using this term. Um, we can trace it to other glossaries and other glossary terms. There's all kinds of metadata here available for me. So most likely, everything that you could ever need for a glossary is already here. But I'm just going to play that role of needing some unique ID that never existed before for glossary terms. So what I'll do is um, quickly navigate using the top navigation bar to an ontology that represents glossaries inside of Top Rate Edge. So if I go to the glossary model, it's going to open up the glossary ontology in a new tab. And um, I can even visualize the class diagram. Everything about a glossary term is here and available to me. I can expand it in this panel. And I just said the word panel, and that prompted me to mention the panels and the layouts. Everything in the screen right now, um, and you notice the layouts here at the top of the screen, um, I, I can go to different layouts and different panels. I'm demoing Top Rate Edge 6.3 beta. It just went live yesterday. So we released beta 6.3 yesterday. I'm demoing it to you today in a webinar. And we already actually have clients that are building custom panels very specifically for their needs and their use cases to, to suit a very specific user experience. So everything in the screen is driven by the models and the GraphQL that I'll start demoing here shortly. So the GraphQL service um, drives all of the results and the layouts and everything that you see on the screen. So very flexible user experience, adaptable to what your role is. So for example, a subject matter expert may see the data or information differently than say a business steward or a data steward. So different roles can lead to different user experiences and different layout patterns. So highly flexible user interface, that's part of this demo, the flexibility, but what we really want to do is come here and say, okay, a glossary term um, has a new relationship, never existed before. So up here, I clicked on glossary term. Down here in the bottom, in the identifiers metadata section of the metadata about a glossary term, I'm going to click the plus button and create a new attribute. And we'll call it um, some ID. So I've got some ID. Optionally, can be one at most, and let's say that it's just a string. Click OK. I didn't have to know any proprietary language. I didn't really have to know much about semantic web standards even. I came here, I got used to this layout, and I said, glossary terms need to have some ID that never existed before. They're not allowed to have more than one of them, and the value should be a string. And I did all of that through form building, and I didn't have to know any kind of um, deep technology or specific language to do so. So now that I've done this, I should be able to go back to my glossary now. So I've gone back one tab, I'm back to the healthcare glossary. And if I basically click the refresh button here, um, because it was just sitting here still, click the refresh button and uh, let's click on access. And I should, instantly get my change here. Let me um, go into edit mode. One second here. What I what I have to do is check to make sure that the ontology is the where we made those changes um, took place for a glossary term. And now what I want to do is inside of the healthcare glossary, see that some ID is actually available to me whenever I'm looking at um, glossary terms. So if I focus on all glossary terms, select access, I was expecting some ID to actually show up automatically um, in the identifiers metadata section. So um, with refreshing, with a hard refresh, it picked up some ID. And if I click on it, I can do the inline editing. And this is where I can at most have one some ID and it could be a string. So if I give access uh, some ID of, um, let's just say ABC, I can save my changes now. 
and top rate edge knows, for example, not to give me the little plus sign that would exist right here um, because I'm only allowed to have one of these. So it is already enforcing the this characteristic known as sum ID. Now, progressing with the demonstration, sorry about that. If I go to the exports tab, go to my GraphQL queries, what I want to show is that the same way that the human user interface was able to work with glossary terms, I can programmatically work with glossary terms. So I just pasted in a new query, and this is simply going to go and get me all glossary terms. So you saw it instantly, and there's hundreds and hun actually there's thousands of glossary terms in this glossary example. So it instantly went and got me the label and the unique ID for every glossary in this knowledge graph. And then if I want to keep working on different kinds of queries here, I can copy and paste and put in different things. So if I now query specifically for that access glossary term, and I have the, the search parameter for some ID to actually be part of the result, um, there it is. So by adding some ID, a random data type attribute to glossary terms in the ontology, automatically, sorry for the delay there, automatically popped up on the user interface for me to start populating and working with if I wanted to, or if I had some sort of importer, or if I wanted to import a spreadsheet, I could populate some ID now. But more powerfully, it instantly became part of the web service tier. This is GraphQL. We'll introduce it here in a second. GraphQL is a JSON query language where I'm able to come at the exact same content that our human user interface did because GraphQL is being used to build both. This result set that you see here and all of those fancy panels and layouts and results in the user interface. So everything I need for glossaries is programmatically available to me exactly the same way um, uh, the, that the user interface is able to get it. And I actually have directives and searching capabilities here that are very powerful. So I'll paste in a new example, and I'm gonna return the same structure, but now I wanna search on a very specific query text. So I actually, I'm searching on this ability to obtain medical care. So which glossary terms mentions that phrase? And if I search, um, I'll get my results. And there's quite a number of them. Um, and somewhere in here, access will actually be here because um, it has that search um, search results in it. So um, if we wanted to, we could find access in the search results. What I need to do now is jump back to the presentation. I lost a little bit of time there. Um, so instead of continuing with the glossary example, let's get back into the presentation real quick and move on to the next example. <clears throat> um, when I introduced glossaries and that flexible example of making adjustments to the model and then populating it and even querying it, um, I introduced the 16 different asset collection types, so that information architecture that's built into top rate right edge. We saw through adding some ID to the glossary term that, um, that we can extend it and add attributes and characteristics when we need to, to those existing models. And we can build entirely new models if we needed to. Um, an example that we see on the screen right now is this is a mock med medical enterprise. So if we started at the bottom here um, and say, okay, in the other collections category, we have a glossary and some reference data. Moving up to data assets, we could represent open MRS data assets that are um, typical in a medical environment. Data sets that could be coming from all over with folks that are collaborating, doctors, um, students, all kinds of different data set content. Moving up from there, you could represent information uh, systems rep, you know, it, that are running and operating in that environment. How the data is flowing and moving about from a technical perspective and what the security aspects and the packets look like can all be described as technical assets. And before I move up a tier, let's just say that this is a nice separation of current concerns on purpose because different roles and responsibilities, top down, middle out, bottom up approaches can be used across these different asset collections so that you can put a lot of things in motion at one time 
and then start connecting them and map any of these different levels and, and representations of metadata to each other whenever, whenever that gap has been filled and whenever that mapping is possible. So you can get a lot of things going um, all at one time inside of this environment. And then at the enterprise level, um, representing things like the hospital's organization structure for maybe like point of contact and responsibility mapping, but then also rep representing another kind of organization, businesses that the hospital has to collaborate with or gets maybe data from. And then you could map these business organizations to data sets that maybe they're the owners for or um, they're responsible for, whatever the relationship is can be put into place. And then ultimately all the way to the top, because lineage assets themselves are actually first class citizens in top rate edge. Lineage seems or think you can think of it as an abstract way, but if you wanted to name a lineage and make it referenceable and share it and have those um, uh, the, the different kinds of you, um, uh, graphics and visualizations that we have inside of top rate edge for the lineages, you can name these and represent them and share them with people. Um, so all of these different assets are maintainable and manageable in an independent way, but then highly connected. Um, and we'll see as we move on that top rate edge is highly composable. And there's even aspects that are self-composing that, uh, that connections happen automatically at times. On the right-hand side, the governance assets, it's important to draw this in, in this like um, vertical point of view because governance assets span all asset collections. So if you have issues and policies and requirements, responsibilities and roles, subject areas and teams that you belong to, um, and things that you're trying to accomplish across all asset collections, you need to be able to do so. And then we can trace the different as, um, asset collections to these kinds of things like business areas and subject areas. So a glossary may be owned by a very specific business area or uh, an, an instance of a business area, like a tiger team or a, uh, a task force, could be the owner of different asset collections, such as a glossary. So those asset collections need metadata. That's what drives a knowledge graph, is the metadata, the, 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 the graph that you're populating and wanting to connect. And a common scenario that we see is that right side of that of that cartoon diagram that I worked with up um, at the beginning, the data governance team and the business stewards and those types of folk are coming in um, uh, after a system already exists. So they can use top rate edge and build their controlled vocabularies and start on the meaning problem and build up reference data sets uh, they can even do the, the bottom-up approach and start populating. They can come at it from top down as well. Um, but the thing is, is that in an infrastructure where the data already exists in a lot of different places, yes, top rate edge has a lot of different connectors. But um, if you're picking up a little bit of negativity in my voice, it's because a system like top rate edge is expected by the data governance people to be able to do everything. So in addition to the all the knowledge graph cool stuff that we do, we also have to retrieve, connect, transform, schedule, and um, trigger on event, all kinds of great things. Well, it's wonderful. Top Rate Edge has that backbone. It is quite a platform. So I'm positive about this scenario, but it's it's always awkward to have to come in after the fact and then be expected to go and get everything from everywhere to bring it into, jokingly almost, the mediation hub, instead of being the aggregation hub or the centralization hub for data governance. Usually it's about mediation, and then that content gets consumed outside of, out, out of top rate edge again, and it starts back into that cycle to where content in your knowledge graph could actually be content that has to come back into your knowledge graph. So you're, you're, you're plugging into this environment that is already operational, and it's almost like you're just adding a block to that, to that architecture. And ultimately what we want is to fill the gaps. We want to be able to um, be that knowledge graph that has the final user experience for the, no, for the data governance office people, 
um, that would be populated in real time. So yes, we can sit into an existing environment and we can connect to things, um, but ultimately moving forward, that's part of what the message today is for, and we'll see more of that example. Actually, we'll take a look at it right now um, using an organization example. So if I go back to top rate edge again, and let's go back to the home page, close off my other tabs that we were using. And this time, go into an enterprise asset, navigating on the left-hand side here. I've got one collection, it's called organizations. If I click on organizations, I can focus on, um, I can focus on all of my uh, organizations. Um, actually, they're popping up automatically because they are enterprise assets now that I've uh, clicked on it. But if I show you their type statement in the column here, if we show you, um, show you that, you can see both Acme Corp is a, let me turn off my unused properties here. There we go. We've got Acme Corp. It is a type of organization. We've got Top Quadrant and Top Quadrant has been connected as, as a data source for different things. So that's why it has other tabs available to it. And it has a tag of TQ. So it has metadata that Acme Corp doesn't have. But um, I don't wanna have to force this con to connect to something to find out about new organizations. I don't wanna have to pull a data source to know that there is a, a new organization providing us information, uh, data, you know, data sets from a new source, for example. So that metadata could actually come to us through web services. So Top Rate Edge could be in the listen mode and actually be, re be receiving that content. So once again, let's go over to that exports tab and take a look at um, uh, GraphQL. And I've got to paste in, um, actually there is a, there's, there is a query here already that I can run. This is basically going to do the get me all organizations example. So if I do this, I can run it and you can see nothing has acronyms at this point. They're showing up over here as null. So I've got those two results. I've got Acme Corp and Top Quadrant. Um, but let's go ahead and add a new organization, an organization that never existed before um, in our environment but something picked up the fact that there was a new source provider. So instead of maybe a business steward having to come to the system and actually make sure that the, the pool request, uh, you know, the connection was made or um, the timer went off to go and get that information from some complex environment, um, the, the infrastructure team could actually be identifying the fact that there is something new and they could register it directly against top rate edge. So I'm gonna do a mutation here that's GraphQL terminology for an insert, basically, or an update. So if I run this one now, um, I can see that it ran over here. I've got my feedback. The commit did happen. True is a good uh, sign over here. But maybe that's not enough for me. I also just picked up the fact that not only did this new source, which if, you, if you're looking here over on the left-hand side, this is the Rexham Mailer Hospital example. So not only is this hospital existing, but we just picked up some new information about it, and it actually has a um, an acronym. So I'm gonna run a second mutation, which is gonna basically perform an update. So if I paste in a new one here, we're gonna insert against that existing organization the fact that it now has an acronym. So we picked up a micro change. This is like a micro transaction that we identified new metadata, about an existing identified object. So there already is a resource or an asset inside of Top Rate Edge known as Rexler Mailer Hospital because we just inserted it. And then maybe later at some point, we also picked up that there's more metadata and I'm simply using acronym as the example here. So I'm gonna run this one. Once again, I see that, my, um, my, that it ran successfully. And at this point, I should be able to re-query with that first query um, that basically goes and looks for um, all organizations and if they have anything, get their acronym. So what I wanna do is take, um, take my query, get it back in here. Actually, let me see if I can just use the, nope, I was wondering if I could go back. Let me grab this query. I'm pasting these from a text editor of course, so, and let's change tag to acronym. 
all of my query building, you know, shortcutting is built in right here. So I changed it from tag to acronym. And now let's run this. And you can see um, the hospital example is actually the only one that has a populated acronym. And we just created all of this metadata. Simple example. I know it's, you know, really dead simple. We just created an organization, never existed before. And then we updated that organization to have a piece of metadata, simply an acronym in this case. But it could be anything. This, this organization could become the provider for all kinds of new data sets that come in. And because we have IDs and all of this metadata programmatically available to an infrastructure team, they can basically start plugging in and connecting that information in the knowledge graph system in real time. And now if we would go back to the top right edge homepage, from a user interface perspective, I can go right back to my list of assets and you can see, yes, there is now a third organization in here visually. And over here on the right hand side, I can see its metadata. So it was real time ingested through the web services and both sides, integrators and developers and both um, and the uh, actual um, human user interface uh, type users can can start seeing all of the same metadata. Going back to the slides. Um, what we want to do is progress again and uh, real quick the building blocks for that flexibility and extensibility um, is due to the semantic web standards primarily shackle shackle stands for the shapes and constraint language it's a rich language for representing uh, the model constraints and rules about RDF data so this is a very powerful language it really operationalizes knowledge graphs in addition to the semantic web standards, we've really embraced GraphQL for top rate edge because it's, it's a modern language, uh, modern layer, application layer, and it uses JSON. JSON is an integrator and developer's best friend at this point. There's a lot of tooling for it. It's well supported, and really it's basically replacing RESTful APIs. So what you saw me do today with adding a new property and we're querying things, um, we've got dynamic GraphQL being generated from our Shackle engine. So really these two pieces come together, GraphQL over top of RDF because of Shackle and really it's what we're calling semantic GraphQL. So as soon as we make a change in the ontology, as long as I can get my page to refresh, it instantly pops up and becomes available to you. So it's available in the user interface and it's available automatically, programmatically. So I don't have to update some sort of RESTful web service catalog. I can basically adjust my ontology models and the GraphQL schema is automatically updated and generated so that we can actually introspect and query the schema. So far, we've seen updates against um, data set. We've ingested an organization. We queried uh, glossary terms as well. But now let's take a look at a, another example real quick that will show us um, the referenceability in GraphQL terms. It's introspection. Let's take a look at that and pull up my reference data sets inside of top rate edge. Go to country codes. This is going to be our example. In country codes, I can see things. Um, I can click throughout. You know, I can click on Aruba and uh, see it's you know multilingual ISO full names and country codes and everything about them. The tables actually has a saved query built into it, so this is actually um, a saved query that's automatically showing the the borders with relationship so we know that one country can border with another country so this is a semantic model representing something as simple as a country or a country code and it's what we would consider a piece of reference data and therefore I'm inside of reference data sets and in the country codes example but what we want to do is instead of querying for countries let's ask GraphQL what a country code looks like in the first place or what does a country I should say look like and I can run an introspection query against this that will do exactly that so as a semantic web guy a semantic standards guy 
I would normally say, I can look at the ontology and tell you what I need to tell you about a country. As an integrator and developer though, I want to be able to avoid the, the deep stuff and I want to be able to say, okay, you want me to work with countries, well, what do countries look like? And you can run an introspection query like this and instantly get back the portion of the GraphQL schema that you're asking for. And if you were to look closely on the right-hand side, this query is basically responding with the schema that says, this is a country, a country has this unique ID, and it has these categories of metadata, and this is what they look like. So for example, right here is ISO, 3166 two character alpha code. So this would be presented as country code, two character country code. Um, and it is a string and it actually is even showing you it's X, um, XSD data type. So it's, um, it's a string right here. So this kind of introspection through GraphQL is giving developers and integrators the language that they need. And now they can actually work with countries um, they can use this to enforce new applications. You could use this structure to build a new form, say on a mobile device, and then populate that data back to top right edge because it was well formed because you were adhering to the GraphQL schema that is describing exactly what a country looks like. Going back to the slides again, <clears throat> moving forward, earlier we talked about the current scenario, a common scenario of having to be able to connect and get everything. So the data governance team comes in and says, I need to establish data governance. Where is everything? Go and get it. With this approach uh, or a future approach, we want those teams of the data governance and the infrastructure and DevOps and engineers to be able to collaborate in a single environment and log that information and, and register that information against the knowledge graph data governance platform on purpose, with intention, just like they would work with security and access control and other analytics. So the requirements to accomplish this goal, I've been discussing today. The model-driven JSON APIs, dynamic introspection, you know, querying the schema and getting the meaning of the content. UIs being um, dynamic, you shouldn't have to rebuild a system or rebuild a user interface simply because a piece of data changed. Um, and it's important to focus on this idea of being API driven and pumping the content into the knowledge graph instead of expecting hundreds of connectors to work out of the box. Top rate edge is built so you can build a new connector and get content um, in a very quick turnaround. But we're not really in the market of telling you that we have hundreds of connectors that are gonna do exactly what you want them to do um, because they won't do exactly what you want them to do. It becomes a very expensive platform to maintain. It's more expensive to customize all of these connectors that need to do new things that they weren't designed to do in the first place than it was to integrate with APIs intentionally from the get-go. So that's an important aspect of a future scenario as well as working with unstructured content. I've not gotten there yet um, we'll mention that here shortly. This idea, this future scenario, it's what we call knowledge graph driven development. And I wanna use one more demo example and I'll quickly do it. It's focused on logical models. So going back to um, top rate edge again, and going to the home page, what I can do is navigate to um, data asset collections. And I've got several, I've got a few physical data assets, but I wanna look at this logical TQFlix data model. TQFlix is a mock-up of like a Netflix kind of scenario of having movies. Um, and I can click on the logical model and on the right-hand side, we can even visualize that logical model. So you've got, um, You've got the pretty picture to work with and understand and use it for very quick access. We can sit here and populate the metadata that can extend this and map it to physical entities, connect this to glossary terms, other data elements can map to it. All kinds of connections can happen right here inside of Top Rate Edge. And the, the uh, business steward, a data steward, an architect, whatever the role would be, could actually build a logical model. And then if you were wanting to put this into use, what does that mean? it doesn't automatically mean a relational database anymore. 
This could be a JSON schema needed for, say, MongoDB, or this could be an XML structure that was needed for MarkLogic. Um, there's all kinds of different um, actual physical schemas that you could derive from this logical model. And with our GraphQL example, we can do exactly that. So here is how I would work with it as if I was the creator of it possibly. But if I go to the exports tab, go back into GraphQL again, and run the query that's on the screen right now, I'm going to show you what one of those um, entities looked like. So if I run this type of query on the right hand side, what I'm actually populating is the um, is the logical entity um, known as movie. So up here at the top. So what this result set is basically is describing what is movie of that logical entity uh, of that logical model that we were just looking at visually, and what are its uh, attributes and what type of um, characteristic are they? So for example, down here you can see year released is being thought of as being a string. And the genre ID down here that I'm highlighting is an integer. So everything that you would need to develop any schema that you needed to implement this logical model in a real way is programmatically available to you directly into JSON. And once it's in JSON, you can convert this basically into any schema structure that you would want it to. And now, instead of randomly coming up with the physical representation that you needed, data governance stewards and um, uh, the dev teams can work together and collaborate, and it can be designed in one place and then utilized to build any type of physical structure out in the environment. And there's always one single place of reference for where did that content come from, and then that makes it very easy to start logging um, information back to. So the realistic kind of metadata, the physical type metadata starts coming back in. Jesse, I just want to call attention to time. It's 1225. Yep, I'm getting back to the slides, Christy, and I'll be wrapping up. So okay. um, pulling back up the slides. Top rate edge is highly composable. Um, composable in the sense that what we saw today was the ability to uh, query the structure in the schema and populate data directly against it. So human user interfaces and programmatic interfaces allow us to both compose data and schema in a unified environment. And that can also be done through controlled workflows where approval processes and everything have to happen. We actually have cookbook examples in our, in our documentation for doing exactly that, creating a controlled workflow that automatically spins up a working copy. It's a full version control system, basically. So you can inject your data to the right level of governance inside of Top Rate Edge. The user interface, the business logic, everything is highly composable inside of Top Rate Edge. And then really finally getting to that last point that in doing data governance, unstructured content is a big problem for people. So we need to build structured metadata for the unstructured content. And with our top rate tagger and auto classifier, you basically get the add-on to top rate edge that can look at anything from a title to a 500 page document and tag it with controlled vocabularies that it's already governing, such as a glossary or a taxonomy. So we can build business level metadata about unstructured content so that it can follow right in suit with the other examples of connectedness throughout the entire top rate edge knowledge graph. I do have a few examples of inferencing and self-composing as well. They'll be in the slides whenever we make them available to everyone, but they just walk through simple examples that traversing the graph is something that you can do as part of a rule. So for example, um, a disease could be directly connected to a gene because of a pattern that's existing in the data. And a data set can be given a physical location because of where that data is actually being stored. And everything that I've talked about today is possible today and tomorrow because of the powerful platform behind a knowledge graph like Top Rate Edge, where we can do the validation, the inferencing, all of the mapping, 
in controlled workflow kinds of ways in a highly adaptive web service driven architecture. With that, Christy, I pushed it right to the limit. I don't know if we have time for uh, questions, but that's my wrap up for the day. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jesse. And I think we're gonna try and squeeze in one, maybe two questions. I know we're getting close to time. And for those who have to hop off, we will have a recorded version sent to you. Um, if you have a question, please go ahead and submit your question or discussion point in the question box located on the right-hand side control panel. If we don't get to it today, we will um, send you answers um, after the webinar with the recording. So let's just try and get at least one or two questions in really quickly, Jesse. Um, we'll go with this one question. One view is that data governance must be controlled by workflows. How how does that workflow-centric view fit into the knowledge graph-based infrastructure you have shown? Top Rate Edge lets you, uh, good, good question, Christy. Um, Top Rate Edge lets you approach data governance and uh, uh, let's talk about high-level workflows. So an approach um, for one team or one organization or agency isn't the exact workflow that another agency is going to use. So Top Rate Edge was designed with that in mind. So the type of version control and workflows that you would use inside of Top Rate Edge, approval-based, uh, automated, automated checks, all kinds of things that can happen inside of workflows, um, you can accomplish. So really, if you wanted to take a strong workflow-centric approach to your data governance, Top Rate Edge is capable of it because you can define your own governance roles and you can define um, your own workflows that are all represented in the exact same way everything else is. It's all part of the knowledge graph. So you can create your own controlled workflows, enforce them to your liking, having the steps um, be automated or manual with specific governance roles. For example, you might need to go from a business steward to a, some, to a subject matter expert for feedback and then give it to the data governance officer to do final approval, just as an example. These are all composable inside of the knowledge graph top rate edge. Great. Um, this is a question that just came in that's uh, it's a great question. So we're gonna um, try and take this one, Jesse. The question is, how would you extend the asset example for medical enterprise to support a consortium of hospitals? all with slightly differing data and technical assets or even different glossary terminology. What's the pattern to relate the assets for hospital A with hospitals B, C, D, et cetera? Well, one way to answer that um, is to say that ontology's uh, semantic model is probably the best and only way to solve that problem. So that's one way of me to answer it is, is that with Top Rate Edge, you are getting the most capable modeling um, approach for such a situation. So inside of Top Rate Edge, there already is a concept of an organization, and there's also already subclasses of organization. If you needed to in, in, um, create a concept like an institute or an agency that was made up of a bunch of uh, organizations, you can do so. So you could represent the consortium, which was a collection of organizations, they would be members of, and then each of those agencies could have different responsibilities in that consortium. Those, those responsibilities could be enforced, and then those agencies could be providing different data asset collection types. So we have data sets, data sets are subclass, there's a bunch of different types of models already in Edge, and if there's not one there for what you need that a, a specific agency to be responsible for or the point of contact for, we can create that as well. So I can, I'm kind of dynamically creating the ontology model on the fly in my answer. Maybe that's not the best approach, but we can absolutely sit down, add that model to top rate edge, and edge doesn't even need to be shut down for that to come back up and be ready for you to start registering all of that information from the data asset level all the way up to the, the consortium level. Great, thank you, Jesse. We are already over time and there are lots of really good questions that we were not able to get to today, but we will be providing answers to those questions in the form of an email response, along with a link to today's recorded presentation, as well as the slides. 
Um, so with that, we'll wrap it up and we hope you found today's information valuable. And we thank everyone for your attention and interest. Have a great day. Bye.